Hi, this is John Ricciuti at Radnor Studio 21 and Mainline Public Television. And uh, my guest with us today, or Meet the Author, is John A. Light. Uh, some of you may know John because he's been a guest before on the show. He was part of George Anastasia's book, Gotti's Rules, which was an international bestseller. John uh, also uh, has sells books throughout the world, actually, in Europe and, and Scandinavia. Uh, so he's back again because he's part of a new book, uh, a trilogy, in fact, and we're going to be discussing part one of his new book. So, John, thank you very much nice for coming to see you again, John. The uh, book that you have, what is the title of it? Darkest Hour. Darkest Hour. And, and that will be the name of, it's Darkest Hour, part one, part two, and part three. Yeah, yeah. You've really kind of gotten a lot of international recognition since Gotti's Rules. And uh, you, we had a lot of uh, views on our YouTube channel and our, our television station, uh, Radnor Studio 21 and rs21.org. Uh, what have you done since uh, Gotti's Rules? Well, I, I think what happened is I got involved with uh, children's organizations, uh, first-time offenders that have been in trouble. So I did some uh, speaking engagements at uh, Hackensack Police uh, Department, uh, uh, Tom's River. Uh, local police department, uh, some of the uh, uh, juvenile centers, and I got involved with programs with anti-bullying, I think uh, which elevated me internationally where they started doing magazines on me in uh, different places like uh, Paris, my country being Albanian, uh, Living Magazine, Rolling Stones here in the United States, and you know several other magazines in uh, Amsterdam and different countries, the UK, Australia, and I think it just carried on because I changed my life in a completely different direction than I was in, which was on the street, and uh, it kind of just fell into its own. That's where part one of your book comes into play, uh, starting with your childhood. Yeah, it, it, it'll go back and it's going to dive into how I was raised, what I was brought around, uh, the elements of uh, where you live, the zip code of uh, how you uh, develop your habits, not just from your, f your personal family, but the extended family out in the streets that your, uh, your environment brings you into. You mentioned Albania. You're, uh, were your parents Im immigrants of uh, Albania? Yeah, my parents were uh, Al you know, they're Albanian descent and they're immigrants from a communist country at the time. When they left uh, Albania, it was a communist country. They came here to the United States. So they grew up around suppression and, uh, you know, they had a hard life. How did your parents uh, leave Albania? How did, what, did they have to escape? No, Albania? my grandfather uh, was and from the, uh, an area called Gio Hoja, Costa. was the president at that time of Albania, who happened to know my grandfather since they were children. So he, he had a political connection to be able to move my family in and out of Albania when other people couldn't. And he chose to come to the United States and uh, he brought, later on he brought, he went back and he brought my father over with my grandmother. What part of New York did, did you uh, eventually reside in? I lived in an area called Woodhaven. Uh, they nicknamed it Death Haven. It was, a, you know, it was, a, it was a, at the time I thought it was a great area to grow up with. It was, uh, there was areas as such, I guess, and I think we dis we discussed it in a book called the Dome. It was an area where you could get any drug you wanted, and you know we grew up in the '60s, and you know as a child in the, uh, the early '70s, is uh, you know through racism and through some of the drug stuff and Vietnam, and you know those things occurred during my childhood, and, and it was a it was a different type of life, I guess, back then than it is today. The world's changed. What kind of relationship did you have with your father? Very close relationship. I still have a very close relationship with my father. He, uh, his belief of the way he raised me was uh, a way of him believing he was protecting me and uh, raised me not to uh, be a victim. And I took that training, I guess you would call it, and uh, I developed myself into being a killer, into a mob guy and enforcer. Unwittingly, my father thought he was helping me, and unwittingly that, that I believe I was going to step into this world. But in a way, I guess that's what made me survive this life. You said that in your book, uh, I read your first book, you said that you, you were running the streets when you were five years old? You know, at, at an early age, it's three, four, five years old, believe it or not, we're running all over the street. And uh, 
it was again it was a different era and we were raised quickly because we we were on the streets on a constant basis I can't even imagine letting my children, you know, they're older now, but at the time, get on a train like I did. I got on a J train at five, yeah. And I took myself wherever I wanted to go, whether it was Jamaica, New York, and, or whether it was Manhattan. Uh, me, a couple of my friends would just hop a train and uh, sneak on, obviously, and uh, take a ride on the train and come back. And, you know, my parents didn't know where we were, and it was just our norm. And you said sneak on the train. A lot of times you jumped on the back part where the chains are, according to your book. Yeah, you know, we were raised, I was raised in an area where guys, I don't know how much we mention them in the book, but we talk about the older kids in the neighborhood. They were kind of like uh, big brothers to us, and uh, it was a rough neighborhood, and some of these kids were just, some of these guys were nice guys, and uh, a guy named uh, Fitz, we saw Chris Haas, and... Uh, Paul Esposito and uh, this other guy, Frank and Steve Brothers, Tommy Klein. These guys always looked out for us. They were nice guys that kind of babysat us. Well, unwilling, again, my parents find out later on about these guys. They're older guys and they're hanging out in schoolyards in the park. But they also took care of us. So, you know, it was a funny upbringing in, in those areas. You had the Wilson Brothers. These guys were, you know, kind of like father figures or older brother figures to me. And, uh, you know, I, I, I never forgot them. Through, through my life and through whatever, whatever happened in my experience, uh, these guys uh, kind of looked out for me on the streets. This is my, my term, having, re again, read your book. I would describe your father, having read your book, as a degenerate gambler. Would you say that? Yeah, my father was Albanian. I just, so, you know, uh, his usual thing is uh, make fast money, uh, gamble, smoke cigarettes. Uh, he was out on the street a lot, but he wasn't a gangster. He was just a, a hustling guy, and that was our culture back then. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a funny thing because, that it was my, again, it was my norm to see that. And that, that's the way I was raised in a family where not just my father, but, you know, my uncles were gamblers. And this is what they did. They wake up in the morning and they either headed to the track, they headed to a casino, they headed to an underground card game and, uh, or bet sports somewhere. One of the most telling things in your book is when you say, I'm sitting next to a million dollars and I have holes in my shoe. Yeah, again, it's, you know, it's ups and, you know, anybody who knows uh, gamblers, it's, you know, you have extreme highs and extreme lows. My father was a cab driver, you know, half his life. The other half, he owned bars and nightclubs. So when things were good, you know, he owned a place called Hammerhead's, very famous club out in Long Island in uh, West Islip. And there was a rock club, and had some famous groups there, it's like, you know, groups people would know today, the Ramones and Aerosmith and Queen and uh, Zebra. And some of these groups were, were you know, the, the highs of my father's life. And the lows were, you know, gambling and changing prices on uh, clothing and, and uh, baseball mitts to, to hopefully make us a pro ball player. He would, he would change the prices of clothing? Yeah, on, mostly on sporting things for us, and you know he would tell me go stand over there. But as a kid, you're watching your father, and he's he's hustling, and you know those are things that resonated to me, and I took it to an extreme different level. And uh, that's not his intentions. His intentions were to uh, get me out of the slums or get me out of the area of uh, of the way he was raised uh, down in Seward uh, Seward Park. You said your father wasn't a gangster, but how did you get how did you get to own bars in New York without being some affiliation with the mob? Well, he did have affiliation himself. He was affiliated with my uncle was affiliated also with uh, Charlie Luciano, the cousin of Lucky Luciano. Uh, so he was the front guy uh, with the money with my uncle, and so his his affiliation, my father always believed, was okay. But he didn't want to take it to that extra level. He was a, a fighter. He'd get in the ring at box. He'd fight in the street. But he wouldn't shoot anybody, stab anybody, baseball bat anybody, yet his friends did. So he thought I could tow that fine line that he towed, which I just wasn't able to do, and I, and I didn't want to do. I wanted to be that guy. He was very upset when he found out you were going in that direction. There's that one scene in the book with your father, and he confronts you, and he has, he has a gun, and he has drugs, and you had another gun hidden. Yeah, he couldn't understand why I couldn't understand his beliefs. And, you know, my father, you know, in the book, some people, you know, have read the, uh, the, uh, the newly edited copy, where they, they look at my father as being, uh, I don't know if indifferent or cold, I don't know what the words are, but my father's completely opposite. Anybody knows him. He was known as being uh, king of the kids. 
he would always take the kids with us to play. Even though he had no money, he'd take us to baseball games. He'd take us to boxing matches. He'd take the whole group, teach them how to box, teach them how to play ball. He would, you know, hug you, kiss you. But on the other end, he was very uh, hardcore, you know, as far as, uh, you know, disciplinary. And, uh, you know, he was a lecturer. So he didn't want you drinking. He didn't want you smoking, yet he would smoke. He didn't want you fighting on the street, yet he'd fight in the street. He didn't want you in the ring. Uh, he didn't want you to use a gun. And those things he didn't do, and he just couldn't understand why I didn't understand his way of thinking. You took things to another level. He wasn't a gangster, according to you, but you, you went in that direction. Well, he exposed me to gangsters, and I was exposed to gangsters through my whole life in different aspects, whether it was at work, where I worked in a delicatessen, which we discuss in the book, and, or whether it was through baseball, which my coach's father was the neighborhood boss of the Gambino family. And uh, so my exposure was there in every aspect of my life. So he didn't see what I saw. I saw the power, and I saw money, and I saw prestige, and I wanted to be the guy giving everybody uh, that, and I wanted to be the guy that everybody wanted to know. So I, I, I made that happen for myself. Did it occur to you, uh, being Albanian and not being an Italian or Sicilian, that you were only going to go so high in the ranks? No, I mean, you know, at, the, at, you know, at first, uh, I thought maybe that would stagnate me in that life. But then I also understood as I got older and I grew. And even as a child, I started learning plateaus of lessons that the more money I have, uh, the more power I'll have. And the more power I have, the more money I'll have. And the more vicious I am, the more respect I'm going to get. So I decided to be all those things as I kept getting older and older. I kept st you know, raising the stakes for myself. I know having spoken to you on several occasions as a guest on Radnor Studio 21, and, and having spoken to you and I actually develop a, we talk to each other a lot. You're a very intelligent guy. You're multilingual. And yet, what attracted you to that life? I, I think it's just the environment. You know, I, I grew up, like, even the, the street guys I grew up, I mentioned some of these guys who were on the street, but they weren't gangsters. But that's part of my education on the street, to say, hey, these guys, like, you take a Chris Haas, and I haven't seen this guy in years, and I just remember him always looking out for me, and he was a tough guy, but a nice guy, but he was also on the street as a, as a teenager. And I look at those things, and I, I kind of departmentalized that this guy's a street guy, but yet he's a nice guy. And I educated myself in the areas I wanted to educate myself to expand on the street. So w when you look back and, and I say what happened to me, I just kind of think it's the environment. That's why I said somebody was telling me about zip codes and, and you know, it was one of, the, you know, one of the smartest things I heard from an author that I uh, became friendly with, uh, a guy named Lou Romano. And he, he uh, wrote several books. And it, it just resonated what he said because it's very important where you're growing up and the life lessons and education you're getting outside of school. You said you never had a childhood. Well, I think uh, uh, a typical childhood is what is, uh, I meant by that. A uh, typical childhood is a child goes to school at five years old and he doesn't have to worry about um, getting into a fight. He doesn't have to worry about racism. Uh, with busing when I grew up. He doesn't have to worry about, are uh, you tough enough to, to, to fight two or three or four guys? Uh, he doesn't have to worry about getting robbed. This is not a, a childhood for an average kid. That was our childhood. Not just mine, but the guys from our neighborhood, you know, and, and neighborhoods just like mine. You know, I think it's typical from, uh, you know, guys like us in inner cities that you're not growing up innocent. And, and a lot of it is, uh, you know, uh, survival techniques, it helped me survive in the life I end up putting myself in. But on the other hand, uh, I didn't have a typical childhood with, you know, where you're, you're smiling, you're happy, you're not uh, stressed out, and you're not worried about uh, being robbed, killed, or hurt, you know, and that's not typical of a child, of, of a typical childhood. You said, I feel the future, I, I, I never denied it, and I wanted to go to that level. Yeah, I was raised again by my father, by uh, my whole family, one of my uncles, Uncle Sam, that uh, he passed away. He's actually my cousin, but we called him uncle because we grew up in the same house. And he was a hardcore guy. He was in the Army, uh, and uh, I ended up living with him. And I just grew up uh, being tough. I mean, getting hit all the time, whether it's by my family, by my father, by my uncle, 
by my cousins. Uh, when I hit the street, it was the same thing. So violence was always around me. So when, when I learned about uh, being tough, I said, I'm not going to be the one that's going to keep getting hit here. I'm going to start hurting guys that come after me uh, regardless. And I, and I just kept the respect level for, for adults uh, as I moved along. So I made my own kind of rules of what I believed was uh, being polite, being tough, and being a gangster. And I lived by my rules, I guess. Is that where Gotti's rules came from? Yeah, it was one of the ideas. I says, you know, Gotti, whether you like him or dislike him, he lived by his own rules. So, you know, I, I, I guess I got to give him uh, kudos for that because he did what he wanted to do. And I guess in my own way, I did what I wanted to do. I says, even till today, when I made those choices, I don't hide from my choices. I make them. And I live by them, and, uh, you know, most people in the world come first. They, they look at themselves and they come first. I just don't lie to myself. I'm going to come first. The only thing that comes before myself is uh, my kids, my family. I said, besides that, uh, that's the real world. And uh, people, I think, realize that. You said you would kill somebody if you had to. I mean, I did. So if I had to do it again, I, you know, hopefully I never do that again. And uh, I work at that every day, not to lose my temper, not to become the person I used to be. Try to teach kids not to follow some of the things that I've done in the past so they don't suffer the, some of the consequences I had to suffer, some of the consequences I suffer today. So, you know, th th that uh, statement is, I guess, is to protect myself. Yeah, I think I obviously I'm still the same person I always was. I would kill again to protect myself. I would kill again to protect my family, like any other parent would kill, to protect their children. So I don't think that has anything to do with being a gangster or a street guy. I think that's just human nature again, to uh, self-survival and survival of a family. Do you have a violent temper? I have an explosive temper. Um, uh, somebody that meets me says, oh, he, you know, they, especially on the street, they judge you. And they say, well, he doesn't seem like nothing. Oh, he's easy going, he's soft-spoken. He doesn't say anything when we say something. The, the, all the, uh, the, the uh, things I think that people take as, a, as, as judgmental, as a weakness, and to me, I just, I'm quiet and then until they take it to the wrong step, and then I become a different person, and I'm very explosive, and I have no qualms with uh, taking someone's head off, shooting them, stabbing them, baseball batting them. Uh, I'm not in a boxing ring. I don't care if he's looking at me, not looking at me, from behind, in the front, on the side. That's the truth of the street. If anybody tells you anything different, then go in a boxing ring. You, uh, you mentioned in the book, you only mentioned him briefly at one time, Robert DiBernardo in, in Times Square. What, 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 what was your connection there? Well, DB was a made guy in the Gambino family, ran the porn industry. And I think uh, one of the reasons I talk about it is because I also speak about uh, being uh, molested as a child by a neighborhood priest that uh, at the time, again, with children were out there and uh, he was trying to take us to see a movie, Deliverance. And some of those things as a kid, you know, I was very street smart, so I should have known better. And, and I think back about it now and how much of an effect it had on me. Maybe some of the anger issues I had came from that. I'm not sure I'm not a psychiatrist. I mean, I go to see a psychiatrist on a regular basis. And some of these discussions are what we discuss over the years. So I think DB is uh, somebody that... Uh, he wasn't in that industry. It was money. You're a street guy. And, you know, again, I'm not judging him. It's just part of my life. This is, uh, you know, people can judge him, and he's, he's passed away, and, and uh, I guess God will judge him, judge, judge me for my past. And it's just part of my life and, and part of the path I took and uh, where he touched my life, I guess. If I were, and I guess I would never really make a, a good gangster because I would be worrying all the time about getting killed. Did you ever think about getting killed? No, I, you know what? It, it Maybe subconsciously I did, but really what I start, you know, back, and I don't have that uh, problem anymore, but I would be, I'd worry about constantly dying from a disease, a hypochondria, you know, things of like that nature. And I think what I did was I dealt with my uh, issues maybe of worrying about getting killed in that way. I'm not really sure. And, uh, but I never really thought about uh, getting killed on the street. I was comfortable there as far as I thought. Uh, consciously I was comfortable there, maybe not. Uh, the same way I am today, I just move around the way I feel like moving around if that happens. I'm more conscious of flying or, or doing something like that, if dying that way, or, uh, you know, uh, drowning, or, you know, it's, it's something I'm not comfortable with because I'm not a big swimmer. 
But as far as the street, nah, guns, anything, they've been pulled on me. I've been shot at. I've been, you know, hit. I've been stabbed. You know, so those things are just uh, part of my everyday growing up since I'm a kid. I'm used to it. Uh, being hit with bats and clubs and breaking jaws and arms. I mean, it's just natural for me. And uh, that's like a pain thing that, you know, I, I kind of grew up uh, ignoring pain. That was one of the, uh, I guess, uh, lessons learned in my house. Ignore pain and keep moving. Do you think if you would have been able to continue with your scholarship at uh, University of Tampa, your life would have been different? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, baseball was uh, something, was a dream my father had for me and my brother Jimmy. And it, it was his dream that became our dream. And, you know, I had a big in, incentive and push to, to constantly be aggressive because my brother was a natural athlete. And I was always you know, younger than him trying to, you know, follow his footsteps, be the, you know, we played ball everywhere. They'd choose my brother first or they'd choose another guy that was very good friends of mine later on, becomes one of my partners, Joe Galliano. The, him and my brother were natural athletes. And, you know, so I think when I started following these guys and trying to develop, it helped me to become the ball player I did. And I think my life would have been different if it continued. I mean, but that's an, another riff, and you're never going to know. I'll never know. That's another lifetime, hopefully. You actually go throughout Europe and as a speaker. What, what, do, you, what do you tell kids today? Getting where I, where I was is and, uh, the way I'm doing things now is the right way. So if you want to be... What, what I am today, and as somebody with an influence. I talked to uh, father and son, Adam and Sam Greenfield from the UK. Um, the father contacted me about the son, and these are the things that are very important to me. As a kid that's a tough, tough kid, that's in trouble, he's hanging around gang members, some of his young friends uh, uh, got killed and getting hurt, and he was going on that path. And the father asked me to speak to the son. The son just won his first pro fight in Thailand. He fought a guy that had about 25 fights. So it wasn't a give me fight. It was, a, it was actually, he fought somebody way ahead in, in, in uh, the pro field. And the kid became somebody different. And you got a lot of kids that talk to me now through different countries about uh, the Greenfields because of who he became. And I told the father the other day through the internet, you know, your son is becoming someone like a younger me now because he was a street kid that turned his life around fast before he suffered the consequences I did. And he is somebody that other kids are looking at. So, you know, it, sometimes things go full circle and that kid's going to be somebody that's going to influence a lot of young kids out there. And it's a great thing. And it's, it feels good for me to know that I possibly helped save his life and he's helping other kids save their lives. So that's the, uh, you know, what you get back for, you know, living the right way. Where will book two take us? Book two is going to take us. I think book one ended about when I'm about 19 after I get stabbed up. And uh, it's going to take us into the mob world. And, uh, you know, really dove deeper into the mob world. Not about the Gotti so much, but exactly what happened to my life and what I was doing uh, after that. The book one uh, prior to Darkest Hours was Gotti's Rules, which we talked about, you know, my situation with the Gotti's and different aspects. That's not going to be book two. Book two is going to be basically just now me in the streets, in the mob world, and uh, some of the thinking process that went on, the family process. Because we're always gathering new audiences, I think it would be fair for you to talk a little bit about Gotti's Rules. Well, you know, there's so many shows out there now about uh, the Gotti family and myself and our involvement, what's accurate, what isn't accurate, what's true, what isn't true. And, you know, I, I think I got way past that these days. It doesn't matter. I says, uh, you know, the people, my message is to uh, people that read the Gotti, the Gotti book, the Gotti's Rules book, my book, uh, any kind of shows they're watching is uh, the lifestyle itself. You can't be ruthless and also be loyal in a life with guys on the street. It doesn't exist. And, and you know, really what I'm trying to teach kids is, listen, you look out for number one, but look out from the right way. Uh, live your life, get educated, look at uh, Chief Little from Tom's River, you know, I met him at a karate expedition, uh, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Jason David Frank, is, became an 8th degree black belt at that event, and, you know, I was just really impressed with there where you're going to find friendship, loyalty, um, you're going to find uh, a development in these schools, whether it's that, karate, sporting events, where you can have loyalty, you can have friendship. 
but you're doing it in a positive direction. You're not talking about robbing somebody, taking someone's lives, or kids going to jail. So when you see these guys, and, and Chief Little, and I, I, I just did a talk at, his, at Tom's River for him, at uh, his police station to a couple groups of uh, kids and uh, some officers were there. And I discussed the respect level of uh, someone that's just a gentleman, and it doesn't matter what you do for a living, whether you're a truck driver, but just going to positive directions, you don't suffer the things I suffered. Or some of the victims that I'm friends with and families, uh, you know, the Goddard Up family I'm very friendly with. I was involved in taking uh, uh, Bruce Goddard Up's life, and it's something that uh, I live with. I discuss with the family on a regular basis. and. You know, and, and, and I try to make amends for it the best I can. I mean, I can never bring that, that man's life back, but I can uh, at least try to talk to some kids not to do what, I, you know, what I've done in the past. You know which family doesn't like you. Oh, I mean, they, listen, they, you know, there's a ton of families that don't like me. I can't, you know, whether, especially when you're in the public eye, you got a lot of people that talk ridiculous convers talk from grown men. Uh, they get some insecurities. They want to talk like tough guys. They had their chance when I was on the street to be a tough guy with me. So those same guys were never around. They hid, you know. So now when they talk like that, I just ignore. It. I take it for what it is. They want some attention, and uh, I gotta laugh at it that they want the attention that way. You know, grown men. I mean, you, I, I guess they got an excuse at, at 20 years old, and but at uh, 40 and 50 and 30, and you got no excuse. You're a grown man. So I, I don't I don't give them that attention they want, and but there is a ton of families that don't like me to get it, so I wanted them. But uh, I got no respect for you know the guy, and I've never apologized for being part of his murder. He was a convicted rapist. He tortured the girl, beat her up, and, and I'm never going to apologize for that. I says uh, I'm not at that point in my life. I says and maybe one day I will, and I got to answer to God for being involved in that murder, but not to that family or not to him. The Gaudis don't like you. Well, the Gaudis don't like me because they don't like, you know, me discussing what's accurate in the street world, the mafia world. Uh, uh, Gaudi himself uh, did a tape on on uh, John or his son. John Gaudi Jr. Uh, did a tape on him, his cooperating. He called himself a cooperator, weak moment rat, whatever. And, and that's not even important that he did that tape and then he took it down. It's the important part to me is the message to kids. Do something positive. Send some messages to kids. You know you cooperated. I know I cooperated. It's, but the message is you're doing nothing but negative talking in, in, in social media or on TV. I have friends of yours Just doing the same the thing. John Gotti Send a positive message. Away, a horrible death. Unfortunately, these kids that see this uh, got to understand he suffered. He suffered without his family. He suffered without his without his grandchildren, and he died a horrible way. And uh, whatever he chose for his life, he chose. I mean, he, he, was he a tough guy? Yes. Was he a gangster? Yes, he was. And, uh, but that has nothing to do with the message to help kids now. You know, break the cycle, teach your kids something different, teach my kids something different, and let's teach kids out on the street something different. And, and really, that's where the message's got to be. Do you think that the uh, uh, children uh, are any different whether they're inner city or whether they're wealthy suburban? No, I, I think I do a lot of talking about that too. Some of these wealthy kids, you know, people don't understand. Even I didn't as a, as a child or as a young man. I used to talk about these spoiled brats, this and that. But that's not true. That you know, the, the problem with some of the wealthier kids are their parents are not around. They're not getting the love and support, even though they have financial support. They're not getting. The, the love and support they need from a mother and a father and a family. And that's where the issues come in, where they're using drugs. They're running around and they're doing the things that, like Michael Douglas' his son, he may be a good father, he might love his son, but just didn't put the time in because his career called for something, a different life. So some of these kids that have been in trouble, you know, I think you got to reach a hand out to them. And you also need to talk about some of these good kids that don't get in trouble, that are from both groups, without parents or with parents that weren't around but are wealthy. And because they're not, they're, they're choosing to take the right path. They're not taking uh, the negative path. So, you know, it, it, you know, all walks of life, there's reasons why people get depressed, why people use drugs, sell drugs. They go out and they, they do, do bad crimes. And I don't think it's so much a status of wealth or not. Uh, I just think it's uh, the neighborhood, the environment for some of us that grow up in the poorer neighborhoods. The exposure is a little more as far as the streets and selling drugs and, and, and murders and robberies. 
for the wealthier kids, I think they look for an outlet that when they don't have families. So I, I, I think it's, uh, it's twofold for, for all the groups. I want to go back real quickly to, to Father Farrell, the molesting priest. Yeah, John, John Farrell, yeah. Did you take care of that? No, I didn't. Actually, I had some friends that, uh, real good kids, grew up. They were the group of friends that were real good kids. They didn't go into the street world. They became successful guys in the business world, and uh, they took care of it themselves. I actually met with them prior to them doing it, and I wanted to take care of it with them, and I said, I'll go with you, and they didn't have, want no part of that. They wanted to take care of it. He ruined a lot of lives. Uh, he uh, touched and fondled several of our friends. He raped several others. Uh, he ruined their lives mentally. And uh, you know, some of them don't talk about it at all. Some of them do do some talking about it. And uh, as a group, he would have us together and uh, play games that, that we discuss in the book. That uh, it wasn't he had the audacity with groups of us to uh, have our friends hold and touch. Uh, he would touch our friends all down, thinking we're playing a game, we're just hosing kids down and playing with shaving cream. Kids being kids were seven years old, eight years old, what do we know, uh, nine years old. And uh, he took advantage of uh, us being children, us respecting the, the collar. And me at the time, I wasn't even a baptized Catholic at the time. You know, people ask me also about that. Do I believe that, you know, how am I still Catholic? How do I wear a cross? Because he's a human being like anybody else. Uh, and he was a bad human being. He took advantage of children. But God, I uh, have faith in. And things, I guess, we don't know the bigger picture. And that's my belief. Uh, I don't blame the whole church. I just blame the people that were involved that covered it up. And, uh, and whoever was... Uh, you know, running the diocese at that time that allowed this stuff to go on. I guess they got to pay one day to God also. In order to write this trilogy, you had to really get inside of yourself. You had to be willing to, quite frankly, you're not the same John A. like the first time you and I talked, and that was when we did God is Rules. You kind of evolved from my experiences in, in talking with you you really had to get inside of yourself to do this. Well, I've been seeing a therapist, Mickey Stafford, for uh, about 30 years on and off, and she's helped me over the years to uh, hold my temper, have the thought process, but don't react to my thought process, because my initial thought process is always the same when someone's bothering me, is to react the way the old Johnny did, and uh, I don't do that anymore. So she helped me tremendously. She also helped me to, to uh, release whatever is inside me to have those conversations. Don't be shy. You know, you you know and over some of these conversations we had, I talk about uh, crying. I talk about depression. I talk about things that I guess some people won't speak about. They're embarrassed. But everybody feels the same. We're all human beings. We all have different feelings. And, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of. That's part of life. And, and you move past it. I can't go in the past. So I'm going to keep moving forward. Like Joel Olstein said, you know, the uh, windshield's a lot bigger than the rearview mirror for a reason. So just move forward and, uh, you know, take life for what it is, enjoy it, and that's what I try to do these days. God is Rules unto itself was a, was a, a Netflix series. Uh, I think what you have now, I think, will benefit a lot of people. It'll be very, very helpful. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, George Anastasia is a phenomenal writer and author, and, you know, George uh, dives into something, goes and investigates. He's incredible, and the, the woman that's doing the book with me now, Susan, is uh, an, an established writer, uh, so she's written many books, and, and she's also, uh, and I think doing a book with a woman, and, you know, it's easier to speak about, maybe because my therapist was a, a woman. It's easy to open up and speak about some of my personal things and her investigation, I guess, speaking to some of my friends and, and, the, and different people that she spoke to and, you know, some of the discoveries she did in some of the schools and some of the stuff that went on uh, made it pretty easy for me to, to continue doing what I'm doing. And I, like you said, I'm different. I've been speaking to different people on a different path and my mindset's completely different. So it helps me to move forward. And these books, uh, for me, are, uh, you know, they're uh, therapeutic in a way. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. I, I, I appreciate you taking the time, and I, uh, I, I appreciate you uh, giving us a premiere with John A. Light, international author. 
I hope you found this educational and informative. And thank you very much. This is John Ricciuti from Radnor Studio 21 and Mainline Public Television. Hi, John. Nice post on Sam. He will be buzzing. I know we've never actually met, but you have no idea how powerful your words were to him. He was in gangs, guns, knives. His friend was murdered. We were at our wit's end. I'd been there, but he wouldn't listen. When you took the time to message him and show concern, it really hit home with him. When I see my son now and how well he's doing, there are a couple of people I think of who helped him live his dream, and you are one of them. From my family to yours, big love and thank you.